the, the tenets of, of, one of the principles of that is that you meet people where they at. And people shouldn't be specifically working with community, meeting you where you are at. Already there's, there's that, that disconnect, there's that power imbalance. And the question is, how then do we work more efficiently with communities if we don't even understand many of these systems? Do we understand that the agricultural practices that exist in communities across the African continent, the indigenous governance systems, um, the spiritual and religious practices, the medicinal plant knowledge, the cultural festiv uh, festivities and celebrations, and the arts and craftsmanship. You know, going into searching on Google and Google Sol Scholar and the various um, platforms to look for a lot of this information is basically non-existent. And why and who is it coming from? The information that is usually there is coming from a place of where people walked in to the understanding of, of what is the understanding. Oral tradition, the Yaga Guda um, in Ethiopia practices oral literature and storytelling. Storytelling from the beginning of time has been an African way of doing things. And how often do we understand the stories and how does it contribute um, to the research paradigm? The apprenticeships in um, Luganda, Uganda, it's a cultural and spiritual practice among the Baganda people of Uganda, centered around the institution of kingship and ancestral reverence. Mesidinal plant knowledge, Mufumbe is a traditional Lingala term for mesidinal plants or herbs. Things that happen within our community and the question we're gonna consistently ask is how do we incorporate it? How does it become a part of understanding communities and how are communities able to participate actively to find solutions to the challenges that they face within their own context? So with the past cycle, it goes to the planning, the priority setting, the design, the procedure, is community involved? Pause, like, it's like a wheel that doesn't stop turning. The action together Communities need to be the experts of, of, of many a thing, uh, of all things. Um, and that comes from the restorative practices realm. We often experts walk in, and this is not an insult or disrespect to the experts because they also come with the range of knowledge, but experts walk in and then experts walk out. So the question when we talk about PAR is how do we create sustainability within the many process that we are implementing within the community? Back to the last slide. Back. Uh, I must go to the PAR cycle. Okay. Um, observation. Once we've done the action, we've got to observe. Because when we're observing with the community, we're able to see our shortcomings and then we reflect on that process. But then that process keeps moving. We keep going through the planning, the action, ref observation and reflection. Um, and it's a wheel. And hence the reason why with any engaged research, it's not just about walking in. It's about consistently moving, moving, moving with the community. Next slide. So some of the key features is collaborative. It's a democratic process. It's long-term process and commitment. It's not something that we just walk in and do um, for a month or for a year. We're working with community, we're working with individuals, we're working with people. And the dissemination process involves all partners. But one of the key things is this co-learning, this co-creation process that needs to embody the spirit of participatory action research and engaged research. And, and it needs to be beneficial to both the researcher and that of the community. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And with the engaged research project or agenda for impacts in the NSI, we want we aim to try and understand the existence and the experiences and the uh, priorities of local engaged research champions and synthesize. We plan to synthesize the evidence of research with other institutes. We want to increase the awareness of engaged research, broaden participation, and build a trend or shared knowledge around this engaged research. And by doing that, this is how we, got, we are we starting with um, collecting information um, 
trying to get data trying to get stuff into um creating a database or knowledge base and a knowledge hub for engaged research and that's how i get into the methodology of the scoping review that we had um <laughs> planned to present so with the methodology, what we basically did was just to review how it, how is engaged research evolving in the African context and how involving communities in the African context looks like. We went through various processes, which I'm not going to get into now because of time constraints, but we went into a lot of uh, databases, Scopus, uh, Google Scholar, PubMed, and we looked for as many journal articles and community engagement projects that have been done in the past by other African countries and and just sussed out how they implemented what they did and how to take from that and from that and from there on we are planning on writing literature reviews we're planning to create an evidence map and a stakeholder map for us to be able to create a peer or a, a component of engaged research and frameworks that will guide us through under the NSI, they'll guide us through how to partake in engaged research in a proper way, in a guided way. As much as it's a free and unstructured uh, type of research approach, that's what we're trying to aim to. So one of the challenges and, and, and considerations that also come into play is ensuring the sustainability and scalability, because each research um, each community that we'll be participating in has its own unique dynamics and the question is how are we able to work within those spaces and to end with what Nunkululeko had started in the beginning we have a long-standing institutions focus and history on engaged research with proven partners and interlinkages with others in the NSI. The question is how are we able to collaborate um, with each other to be able to, to embrace these participatory approaches and innovation and unlock the full potential of our African countries um, and foster economic growth and, and address the complexities that exist within our continents. What we're also plan planning on doing is that next year, and we will be sending out the invites, we are also calling um, all institutions because the HSRC will be hosting a conference on engaged research as well and looking as to how can we positively contribute um, and collaborate to be able to speak to the unlocking of the potential that exists within the African continents. Thank you. Thanks.
thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity, and I'm quite sure you can see all the names on the screen there. And we were told, sorry, no money, pay for, pay for yourselves, get there however you're going to get there. We can pay accommodation for two people. Well, nobody else could find money for transport and um, registration. So in a way, that, that's what happens. I think what I'm alluding to is the fact that CE is the poorest cousin of anything within a particular university. And I'm going to claim that, I'm going to say it very openly, although I'm always scolded for saying it, but that's fine. We experience it in so many spaces, places, and in engagements with so many people. So obviously within the uh, School of Education, which is part of UKZN, um, there are 19 schools. We are the School of Education, and within the School of Education, we have a community engagement um, committee. Within that school, since 2017, we had the position of academic leader, community engagement, formally recognized and constituted. Within and across the university, there are supposed to be academic leaders for all 19 schools. I just spoke to one of the academic leaders last night, who is here, and he said, yeah, we have it, but nothing much is happening. So, so one of the things that I really do want to say is that it's, last night I sat and I listened to everybody, and I just thought, there's so much that we can do together. We, together, can have a major project with the good practices as well, or even just other practices. Anyway, let me get to what I want to work with. So, so you'll notice the words are grow with and good practices. So how something appears is always a matter of perspective, and that's something that we really, really need to focus on and I love the presentation just now because the historical um, discussion, conversation, we've got to say conversations, are things that we actually shy away from. And one of the questions that I raised was community engagement in the 1820 Settlers Monument Building. Okay, it would be very interesting for us to discuss why this particular place, whose perspective and what are our collective feelings about all of that. Um, and I think when you're looking at that block and you're saying that the block is CE, each one of us, as what, what has been um, evident from, I only arrived late yesterday because we had grad the, the two, 13th and the 14th. Um, so, there are so many terms that are being used for it. And I must say that one of the things that we really have to think about is, yes, there are models that one, one um, or we all use. They are, there's terminology that we use, et cetera. At the end of the day, what are the practical implications and what are the practical initiatives, activities, et cetera, that we are actually working with when we are working with communities. But I just, in terms of setting the scene, yes, every university has a plan, strategic plan. It's a plan, it's a policy. We, we, we really must say that. High impact societal and stakeholder community engagement. Who decides what that all is? And within the School of Education, when we had our STRAT meeting last year, we had a group of um, individuals together, and that is what they came up with in terms of community engagement within the School of Education. And you can quite clearly see the terminology that is being used is very common that you would find within um, various contexts and various documents as well. I think what is also uh, an important aspect is to facilitate and promote avenues for cultural and creative expression to foster a rich, okay, yes, how? Because these are the things that we need to focus on so much more. And if we are setting the scene further and we're saying, let's look at the SDGs and let's look at which SDGs are we working with within our School of Education, quite clearly you can see, um, based on the context within South Africa, not just within KZN, these are the particular issues that we are confronted by and they are not the only ones. 
So the question is who and how is all this decided in terms of which ones are we going to work with? How will we work with it? And also, how will we achieve it in terms of social, economic, and environmental spheres? Um, I think you will know that beginning of this year, NISFAS was the biggest disaster ever, and so many of our students were starving. How do you teach a student who is starving? And, and yet, lectures went on. I have no idea how we, we, we actually relate. Anyway, um, transdisciplinary is what we're working with our communities. And notice the word with is very significant. It's not and, it's not for, it's not above, whatever it is with. And I think that comes out clearly from the presentations that have been um, presented already. And when we think about achieve meaningful interactions, who decides on what those meaningful interactions are going to be? Yes, we've spoken about how we go to communities. Um, do the communities come to us? Do we go to them? What are the meaningful interactions? And when we speak about for or with mutual benefit, um, community engagement is such a complex, complex space that we all engage with. And notice I'm saying that we all engage with in question marks. So what I'm sharing now are just some of the initiatives that we have been working with. And it's looking at the nature of the processes and changes and really the purpose of the relationships that we have, uh, all in all. So with regard to professional development, there are a number of different initiatives that we have been engaged with. And when I speak about professional development, oh, there's a range of how um, it is actually played out. Are we approached by individuals who are looking at programs that can be funded and then get a group of individuals, teachers, etc., together and then promote and actually present these programs to them? Or is it us designing, us, I mean, within our school, designing programs and saying, well, this is really what we have found in the grade 10 or in the grade curricula, grade 10 or 12 curriculum and the issues that teachers are grappling with, so let's design this. Or is it communities coming to us, for example, early childhood practitioners with level two, three, and saying, we really require um, some sort of enhancement. Please, can we have programs that we can work with? And then we have a meeting, and the one meeting was over, the workshop was over 130 people just from the KZN local Durban community who came together. We developed an action plan and guidelines of how we could work, and therefore looked at possible programs that we could be working with. So creativity is one of them, autism is another one of them. And one of the things that, that we are finding is that communities are becoming more and more vocal about what it is they would like to see. And in our last autism workshop, one of the parents um, actually said, you know, it's, it's actually a shame that the universities are not having programs with us as the community. They're only focusing on the students. And that is a shame, a big shame. Okay, so we have partnerships. Oh, sorry, we have a lot of different programs with our students as well. Enha enhancement programs, some of it funded, some of it not funded. And all you do is you ask um, colleagues to um, volunteer. And you can see service learning, obviously, part of modules that we're working with. Mindfulness, and I must say at this point that one of the best modules that we have, which was service learning and research for undergraduate students, was taken out of the curriculum because there was no space for it. I was hell mad. Anyway. Numeric is, so we have a partnership with different uh, groups of individuals. One is with Numeric, and they're based at three universities presently, um, UCT, um, UJ, and us. And it's a really wonderful one. Right now, we have over 70 students who are coaches, and they work with Numeric in this after-school maths program with our learners, sorry, with the learners in grade seven and grade um, six. This year, they started grade six for, the, six for the first time. Now, when we're thinking about the enhancements that are taking place, there are four learners 
who have now gone on to, from that, who have been part of the program, who have now gone on to the Oprah Winfrey School, and they started this year. And the parents and the, and the principals in the schools are saying, please sign up our schools. Um, obviously, one can only work with the capacity that you have, and they're only working with eight schools, but it is a fantastic. Our students are, are taught to be coaches, and there is enhancement with the learners at the school. With regard to the media, and I will go to some of it just now, we have a magazine and we are now working with MUT. I must say that magazine has been in, ooh, you know, nothing much has happened of it um, for the past, I think, six or seven months, basically. And we also have a podcast site, which is really fantastic. All this is driven by students. Yeah, but students don't drive if you're not... Um, notice this needs to happen, that needs to happen, um, and, and it's just, yeah. Anyway, international spaces, within our School of Ed, we have MOAs and MOUs with so many international um, um, universities, and we work with our international office. So in some settings, the international office takes full responsibility for it. In our settings, we take responsibility for it with the international office. This is an example of engaging with communities. We all grow, that's our tagline. Engaging with communities, we all grow. How can we grow with you? And that was a KIC um, climate change education program where we worked with um, 20 geography and 20 natural sciences teachers. And they had to do change programs in the schools. And what we did in our university, we designed the materials for all five universities that were going to run the program. We taught online during the available, although there's a one group that came in last year saying we will charge 2,500. And this is becoming, I'm finding that's becoming more um, of a case now where people come in and say, we'd like to do these programs for your students, but this is how much they must pay. Then I say, sorry, no thank you. Um, if we're going to do anything, it's something that the students must be a part of and they must also decide, but there is no money that the students are going to pay for that. And you can see in the last one, so enhancement program that we had, um, and all the, the staff and students who were involved in that particular one. Um, at the top, that's the service learning and community members who are present at the seminar presentations and them standing up talking about their experiences of being part of the service learning engagements with the students and they obviously with Numeric and, and what has happened with Numeric. I think um, in terms of the School of Education, there's so much more. I will just show you one more bit. Um, community engagement, and we have our own website. And as you can see, in terms of the website, our students, we have a group of about 60 volunteers in our WhatsApp group, and we also share that with the students. So when there's ever an activity taking place, we share that with them and we say, okay, this is an activity, would you like to be involved in this? Um, I just wanted to share this with you. This is the international exchange. We had a student from Brazil. Um, we have an MOU with um, Sao Paulo University and Beatrice in the, in the brown is there. And we have a Fulbright student who is the one on the left-hand side, Ashley. And, and we work obviously with the schools. And we also, in that first visual, we had um, four students from Norway who were also doing their whole semester with us as well. So in, in terms of community engagement, we, we are always asking ourselves, what is it that we need to be doing more of? And when we think about grow, you know, people say, do an impact study, da 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 grow. This is the word that we need to think about. And if we focus on grow, then there are so many other things you can think about. How many people were engaged? Well, how were they engaged? What was the nature of their learning and their reflections on those engagements as well? Um, yeah, I think I'll just stop there because I am conscious of time. Thank you.
thanks so much, Angela, for sharing what you're doing at the School of Education at UKZN. And thanks for representing your group of people, even with all the challenges. Um, so I'm going to open up for questions now. We have a bit of time. I know there were two questions earlier around engaged research. Um, so I'm going to first take some questions um, for this presentation. Um, are there any questions for Angela? It was clear. <laughs> You've left us more than enough time to have a good discussion. Um, so, yeah, feel free. And, and I think, may I, may I say, um, this, this whole thing about the way we're doing community engagement presentations, this must be the last time we do it that way. It's got to be a conversation. We should be sitting with three or four questions and having a conversation and developing um, ideas of how we should be working. And I think when, when we have our autism workshops with the community, we have posters outside and we ask them, so what, what, are, what is your understanding of autism? What has been your experience of it? And then we take all those posters and people are put into groups and they share their particular experiences or the understandings of autism. We will have one plenary at the end, which has now focused on all the questions and the issues that people have raised so that we can now come to a, a holistic and a substantive understanding. And also, I think it's the practical implications because parents in terms of autism um, and also teachers, our next one is in June and they've asked for remediation. We are having big issues with remediation. Please, can we have a workshop on that? So we've also got our health sciences department coming in. They are now speaking about vision and autism. And we're saying, wow, we didn't even know that you're doing it there. And they say, we want to bring our students here to come and also be part of these discussions. In our universities, we are so informed in silos. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Um, yeah, are there any questions around engaged research or what UKZN is doing in their community engagement space? We've got Joseph there, and then we've got a question from Renee. Uh, good, good morning. I'm not going to appreciate the presentation because I was not here. Um, with with reasons, uh, I had a conference call in the morning, very critical one. In my benchmark exercises, I've been studying the models of UKZN as well in community engagement. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> they very like very very interesting model that they are using. But I'm interested in your standard operating model. Um, Often than not, when we do community engagement, we are told that we are not complying with ethical clearance. In my experience, where I'm coming from, ethical clearance will take you three months mm. uh, to, to, to attain from faculties, which is a serious hurdle. Do you share with us a good, good practices in as far as the ethical clearance are concerned, or the process, the value chain of the standard operating process? I, I, I found your document very much insightful. Is it practically possible? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Must I take another question or can I answer straight away? Yeah, that's fine. And then you can yeah. answer them to you. Yeah. My question is for the agent. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, so thank you for that. Um, so yesterday, you know, they spoke about the ethics and, and uh, the fact that there was the, um, was it the medical sciences? Well, we have two. There's the social sciences, and it's all online. There's the social sciences one, and there's for the health sciences as well. Um, when you apply online, what is important, obviously, we have particular guidelines that you will follow, and it's, it's so practically possible to actually get your ethical clearance within three weeks or to a month. Sometimes, and as people who are doing the ethical clearance will say, no, 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 don't blame us, because obviously they are the checkers. You go back to your document and see that you did not comply. You didn't fill in all the other blocks that needed to be filled in. If you go to our web website, if you go to the research office and you go to that website, you'll be able to get all the documents linked to the ethical clearance. 
Um, I think when, when it comes to us, when we were doing the research for the KIC, um, Professor Modali, Ranika Modali is the person who applied for the ethical clearance there. And what was significant, obviously, all the questions with regard to are you working with young children? Um, are you, well, what is the, um, is there going to be harm done? You know, all those types of questions are also asked as well. And I think um, in terms of the, I must say, I have lots of fights with them when it comes to community engagement, because I say to them, um, if you think about the work, you want us to give you the names of all the community people, the informed consent from those community people, etc., before you can give us ethical clearance. We cannot do that. We cannot do that. How can we, and I listened to what was said yesterday, that that initial discussion, etc., with the community is not part of your work. Well, I just think that if you are going to be going into a community and the community are open and they have asked for you to be present, which community, why should they be signing informed consent? For, for me, all that formality, at the end of the day, who's going and checking on all of that? So we do all this paperwork for what? Who goes and checks that all that was actually carried out the way you said you are going to be doing it? For me, it's the integrity of the individuals who are involved in the process. And everybody here will be saying, oh, how can you do that? This is a university. Communities know who they are and communities will tell you what they want and what they will not want. So we need to work with them. We cannot say to, the, to them, okay, sign this consent form before you get engaged doesn't work that way. They need to understand fully. You can explain it to them. It's not the same as doing it with them. So do we do it with them and then get consent? I don't know. But I don't know if I've answered your question as well. It's the messiness and complexity of it all, isn't it? <laughs> okay. so that is how it is. Yes, now. yes. Um, communities are not obsessed with administration yes. work. They are obsessed with what they are going to be touched. Yes. Our sense is at some point in time, we are making this process too complex. Absolutely. And approaching it too academically uh, to the wrong people. Yeah. Uh, so communities are not uh, part of the ideology tower environment. They are on the ground. And if I would go, because normally they would say you want to do this mm. because of your studies, because of your own, mm. and, and then without us benefiting. My thinking is that the work that we should be doing should, uh, I make a narrative of institutions uh, having a, a fundamental responsibility to change the discourse uh, materially yes. and, and tangibly. And um, with projects that are, are, are lifelong, Absolutely. And sustainable. And, and that will respond directly to the economic challenges yeah. uh, that we are having. Um, I, I'm just saying it at that level because it's a concern. And when I check the practice across the sector, you find that we're struggling with one thing. But when it comes to conferences, our conferences are so professionalized to such an extent that we do not even discuss this. Yes, yes, yes. That we yes. find ourselves confronted with when we are at community. Yes. But it's a good model that we are having. As I'm saying, I'm benchmarking, I'm looking at the sector and good practices so that we can better our own community engagement at the UC. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Improving community engagement factors. I'm going to take a question yeah. from Renee. I think it's for the HRC. Yeah. HSRC, um, so they have a mic. Yeah. Um, thank you, Anna. Yesterday I asked a question to the panel that were discussing the South-South and South-South-North partnerships. And I asked them the question, how do we reframe the narrative um, around Africa's future as it relates to research? So my question is in that same line, how and in which way will the HSRC play a role in reframing the engaged research narrative um, in the country. And I'm also, I want you also maybe just your insights with that reframing the narrative. 
the intersection between decoloniality and social and epistemic justice, because that has come the last few uh, days oh, that has been oh. emphasized, decoloniality, um, Prof. Andre Kiet emphasized oh. it, social and epistemic justice. So I'm not sure if um, you can just share your insights, the role you guys can play in reframing that engaged research narrative. And I think the, the question, the role that the HSRC can play, I think it's important to acknowledge that it's not the role that the HSRC can play, it's the role that we can play. Because engaged research is speaking about collaboration, it's speaking about what is it that we can do with our collective efforts to create the framework to engage community a little bit more efficiently and effectively. Um, I think the HSRC is, is looking and seeking to kind of be in a body as well to bring in the respective individuals, community, and that cannot also be done without the community participation in the entire process as well. Because those are the voices that need to be heard. If we're talking about decolonization, how do we do that without the active engagement and participation of the community itself? And hence the reason why we said some of the methods that we're employing in, in some of our spaces need to be revisited. It needs to be, um, some of them need to be dismantled. Um, because is it speaking to community fitting into the box of academia? or academia beginning to understand what is taking place uh, and being able to, to respond effectively to the challenges that community faces. I, I focus on respond to. Who should respond? How? Why? When? You know, and um, quite clearly, I think our recent um, endeavor with the autism workshops that we have been doing came from a foundation phase. Well, it actually came from an ECD center, Romani Roberts, who is based in Wentworth, and she said, do you know how many children are now autistic? We, the numbers have just blown. So it went from her to our ECD uh, collaborative. It's actually called KZN ECD Collaborative, and it's over 130 people in that grouping. From there, they then said, okay, let's have workshops with that. So, so when you're looking at that whole process of how that is evolving and it's growing, um, we, we really have to, to think about that's just one space and one example. How many others could there actually be? And HSRC is like, and there's no frameworks. Everybody has a framework to do something. I'm just saying, forget about frameworks. When we're working with people, that framework you've got in your head is not going to work. Those groupings that we have. We don't need frameworks. We need engagements where there is that real, and I really mean real, because some people will write about uh, engagements, but they're never in the community. But when you're working with communities and that sort of um, interaction, I am going to say interaction, is something that is so significant. And it's about your personality as well. How are you working with people in any spaces that they are in. And at the same time, I'll tell you, there are certain places I won't go to for my safety. And that's it. So you have, you know, you've got, you've got to toddle with all these things. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm done. We've come to the end of our session. Thanks to all of our presenters. I think we have just started a rich debate in this room. Um, so it's unfortunate that we've run out of time for the session, but I really encourage you, our speakers will be around now for tea. So please grab them um, at tea if you want to ask any further questions. Thanks for sticking with us and asking such rich questions and engagement.